A hill to die on is a, is a phrase, it's an idiom that is, is used, and it refers to a conviction that someone feels so strongly about that they're willing, literally, to fight to the death over. That's, that's where you, you just draw the line. This is where you're going to stand firm. In churches, sometimes people draw lines that they think are hills to die on. Uh, what's the worship style? What's the color of paint? How, what temperature do you keep the room at? And those are not hills to die on, okay? Those are personal preferences. Doctrinal issues are hills to die on. They are. Those are things that when a person leaves a church, it should never be because of the color of carpet or the temperature in a room. But if a church starts preaching heresy and we're not true to doctrine, there's a problem there. That's really a hill to die on at that point. So some examples. The deity of Christ. That's one of those. If you're ever in a place in a church, well, in a, in, a, in a group of people, I won't even call it a church, in a group of people that come together and say Jesus is not God, uh, you need to leave. That's a hill to die on, okay? That's one of those that you go to the mat over because without Jesus as God, there is no salvation. It's a whole aspect of his deity. Other doctrinal issues, hills to die on. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. That's one of those as well, because there's only one way to be saved. And, and so as we look at these, these are things that the Bible teaches. Those are two hills to die on. So the phrase hill to die on actually is a military uh, thing that talked about with generals. And when they would look at strategic locations, was that hill, that vantage point, so worth having that it was worth the casualties to get there? That was what they were measuring. Or, in some cases, was that hill really not that important? It's not losing the, the, the military personnel over, the soldiers, to acquire that hill. And see, that's where we as a church really have to, to come to and understand what's really worth dying, what's really worth separating, what's really worth standing firm on. Now, two mistakes were made by uh, military generals at times surrendering a hill that was worth dying on. On the flip side, dying on a hill that wasn't worth it. And the same happens in churches. Don't miss that. This is what happens. We, in the context of the church, too often we find people drawing lines in the sand, dividing themselves, dividing the body of Christ over things that don't matter. And what happens is it results in discord and division and ultimately in departure. People go different directions because they have different viewpoints. And so I want to challenge you this morning, and I want us to look in the book of Ephesians and, and see some of these things. Now, obviously, we understand this. We just came through a, a horrific season, in my opinion. Some of you love it. I have a son-in-law that loves it. He thinks the election time, regardless who wins, he thinks uh, that's like the Super Bowl, man. He just, he loves politics. Uh, I went through a series that each week I was preaching gospel truth, but at the same time I knew that, that there were folks that were, were hearing it differently, and it's difficult as a pastor to do those things, but you want to make sure you're teaching truth. So I know we just came through a difficult time. Some today are happy, some are not happy, but every Christ follower should be celebrating uh, the defeat of Amendment 4, and we celebrated that yesterday, I'll tell you. <laughs> And, and again, that's not a political statement, that's a biblical statement, because abortion's a moral issue, and uh, God is pro-life. He's the author, the giver of life. And so yesterday, we had that opportunity, you saw the pictures on the screen, literally hundreds and hundreds from uh, churches across South Florida that came together to celebrate, and we literally walked through the, uh, what used to be the Astro Women's Clinic, that through the power of prayer, cross-denominationally, when people didn't care who got the glory, it was all about the Lord, and when they just joined together and didn't draw lines in the sand, God answered prayer. And man, it was exciting. It was good. And so that one we agree on because that's a biblical principle. Uh, if you have a different viewpoint, I would encourage you, let's get together and let's talk because I want to show you genuinely from, from the Bible how that's, that's a biblical viewpoint. And on the other side, though, everything else, hey, it goes one way, it goes the other. And, you know, sometimes we're happy, sometimes we're not. But I want to encourage our church this morning as we talk about unity. Over in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, it says this. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplications, 
prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority. And so today, whether you're happy, whether you're, you're sad, whether you wish the election would have turned out different ways, now we together as a church, which never should have been divided over those things, but together in unity, we begin to pray for those that are in different positions now. And I want to do that this morning as a church family. Just stop for a moment. And I want to tell you that uh, whether it doesn't matter who's in office, without uh, exception, we as Christ followers should be leading the way of unity and praying for those that are in leadership, realizing that nothing surprises God and that uh, we, we are, everybody in leadership is a, real, is a result of who God puts there. For the last, you know, the, the existence of our country till now. So it's not, you know, just at this moment, it's, it's all through. And so this morning, let's as a church take a moment and just pray. Can we? Father, last Sunday we, we got on our knees here at the altar and we prayed. And we just said, your will be done. And so God, today we just have to accept that in local elections, state elections, national elections, with amendments, with everything else that was on the ballot. God, we have to believe that your will was done. And so we as people of God had the opportunity to voice our opinions and preferences, and we thank you for that privilege that people have given their lives for us to have such. God, I thank you for each one that took the time to do that. And now today, Father, we lift up every office, every leader, and we ask you to bless them, because we as a Christian people are first citizens of heaven, but also citizens of this world. And in doing such, Lord, we want to be good citizens, not those that are causing conflict, but those that are making peace. And so in our church this morning, we pray that those that are still kind of struggling, regardless of whether it was a local or a national election, they didn't like how something turned out, will you bring them to this verse and remind them that at this point, we're called to pray for those that are in the positions, whether we agree with them or like them or not. But unify our hearts around Jesus Christ, and may this other stuff be put behind us so that we as a church family go forward strong and faithful and focused on the mission that you've given to us. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, what I'd like for us to do is realize that the church should be a unifier. The church should not be those that are dividing. We have one common unifying message, and that message is Jesus is king. That's our message. We are here given a mission called the Great Commission, to go and to make disciples of all nations. And so rather than being sidetracked or distracted by some of the cares of the world, I want to take us right back in so that we, if you're, regardless where you are, you come back to the center and say, this is what it's all about. So this morning, we want to look at Ephesians chapter 2 and see what Paul has to say about uniting Jesus' kingdom together. So, and he also gives warnings of the differences that can divide us, too. We're going to talk about those. So let's look at Paul's lead-in. If you're following along, there's an outline in the bulletin. Paul's lead-in. He starts off by talking about our life before Christ. Look at Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1. He says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world and according to the prince and the power of the air the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as others. So he, he kind of just lays it out there. He says, hey, even people of God, remember where you came from. Remember what has taken place. Your life before Christ, you were dead in trespasses and sins. All have sinned to come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. So uh, when you look at this, none of us have a way out, a way of escape outside of Jesus Christ. We realize that we were all in the same condition, walking in the ways of the world, living for the devil, fulfilling the lust of the flesh. We were all there. And still today, there are times where we give in to that and, and we're there still. But the difference is we have had a transformation those who know Jesus Christ, you are no longer dead in your trespasses and sins. You've been made alive. Look at the next point. We've been transformed. We have a transformation through Christ. Look at verse 4. He says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love 
with, with which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. That means right there that you don't have to get everything right. And there are some, some of you watching online, don't come to church because you think you have to have everything right before you can come to the church. I've heard people say it. And the reality is that God is so good, it says, but while we were still sinners, that's when Christ died for us. He didn't say, get it all right. And then I'll accept you. He said, I love you where you are, and I will make a way for you to be right with me again. Everybody's got that opportunity. So look what it says. Now, even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. You remember in chapter 1 last week we kept saying that he, he would say through Christ, in Christ. He was talking about where we are and who we are. Left to ourselves, we're, we're wretched. The Apostle Paul talks about that. But he said in Christ and through Christ we can do things that we never thought we could do, never could do without him. He says right here, he has made a way that we too are going to sit in heaven. One day we will be in the presence of Jesus. Why? Because God loved us. Even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He made us alive in Christ. He prepares a place for us in heaven. Uh, you remember that some of you that are older would remember the hymn, uh, you know, talking about a mansion. I've got a mansion, you know, just over the hilltop. You remember that? It's a great song. But I got to tell you, my entire life, I thought, why do I need a mansion? Just give me a lean-to in heaven. I'm not going to be in it. Have you ever thought about that? Why do you need a mansion? You're not sleeping anymore. It's not a place you got to set up house. Why do I need I mean, anything more than a tent, just give me a mat. Because aren't we just going to spend our time in the presence of Jesus? We're not going to be inside, man. I want to be in the presence of Jesus. And so when we think about this, God has prepared a dwelling place for us. And he promises that if we trust Christ, that we will spend eternity with him. He promises, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, what does he say? What are the next two words? I will come again and receive you into myself. That where I am, there you may be also. So you look at this and you think, man, we were miserable before Christ. We've been transformed through Christ. And now let's look at the salvation part. Look at verse 8. Our salvation by Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of, the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. What does it say? Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. You help me. I'll say the first part and you add the alone. You ready? Salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. When we put all this together, you understand that was the whole aspect of, of the Reformation. Martin Luther nailing those theses coming out of, of the book of Romans and all these things of how a person gets saved. It's by God's grace. So we look at it, our life before Christ, miserable, dead in trespasses and sins. Then we see that the transformation comes through him. How? Because we get everything right, we get it all in order, then God accepts us? No. It comes because of what Jesus did on the cross. So when somebody says, you know, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not there yet, I'm still working on it. Stop. You can't work on your salvation because salvation is not based on what we do. It's based on what Jesus Christ has already done. When you get that, man, it is liberating to understand all of that. So he starts off just reminding us in this passage. Remember, it's a letter to the church at Ephesus. He's reminding them who they were, how it started, how they changed. And then Paul uses this same pattern of the before and after, and he continues to talk about what the gospel means. So let's continue. In talking about the gospel, he says there's a wall that's built up, though. There's a wall between the Jews and Gentiles. Now, remember, he's writing to this church that has a lot of Gentiles in it now. There are also Jews. And there are some problems. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse 11. 
Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Now, you remember what had taken place at that time. They, they had the Jews that were there, and the Gentiles were coming in. The Gentiles just thought the Jews were abominable. They, or, uh, the, Gent, uh, the Jews thought the Gentiles were abominable. They didn't even want them in the, in the same room. And it's like, how can this be? You know what it was? Let me boil it down for you. It was race wars. People that are thinking this is something new that's just happening today, I'll tell you, I've seen it in our, our country more in the last, what, 15 years than I've seen it before. But, but you got to understand, this is nothing new, and the gospel transcends all of this stuff, okay? God, God's seen it. God knows how to handle it, and he says, get your eyes off of the junk and get your eyes back on me, and it's going to resolve all these problems that people are having uh, dealing with some of this stuff. So in this, here's what happened. The Jews were called the circumcised. Now, the men would mark their bodies. It was symbolic that they were set apart to God. They thought the Gentiles should do the same. The Gentiles said, <laughs> I'm not doing that. I'll do a lot of things, but I'm not doing that. And so they just felt like, you know what, then you can't be saved. That is legalism. The true definition of legalism is when you add anything to God's grace to bring you into better favor with God, whether that be salvation or saying, if you do this, God will love you more. No, God loves you fully. But when you add anything in, and the Jews saying the Gentiles had to be circumcised was saying, God loves you, but you have to do this earthly work as well. Otherwise, nope, he's not going to accept you. The Jews followed the Mosaic law. They believed that they were made right by keeping that law. If they did not keep the law, then they believed that there was, something was going to happen. It was works-based, that God may not love them as much, that there might be a separation. And so you see it today. We see it in the cults and some of the religions that believe salvation is by works. Why in the world do you think these people are going out there giving two years of their lives to knock on all these doors? They, they have to. Why do you believe that, or, that, or think that there are some of these denominations that believe that if you sin, you've lost God's favor, and if he comes back before you repent, you're not going to heaven. It's just being saved over and over and over again. Jesus Christ died once for all, and it's sufficient. So when you look at this, there was a great hatred. Uh, the Jews, thinking they had to keep all the aspects of the law, looked at the Gentiles, and they said, no. You're, you're worse than the worst. They would not even walk on the same side of the street as the Gentiles. If a Jew saw a Gentile coming, they would cross over and walk on the other side until they got around them. They would wake up in the morning and the Jews would thank God that they were not a Gentile. Can you believe that? I know The closest I've ever come to that is waking up going, I am so glad I'm not a Patriots fan. Right? No, 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 no. <laughs> That was just for Bill. So, now I'm kidding. I'm kidding. If you're a Patriots fan, don't get upset, okay? Just a joke. But they are, that's how they felt. They literally would get up in the morning and say, God, I am so glad I'm not a Gentile. Thank you for not making me a Gentile. If a Gentile girl was giving birth and there was a Jewish midwife within range to be able to help, they weren't helping. They would not help. Why? Because they didn't want to have any part of bringing any more Jews into the world. It's very similar, again, those of you that saw the 1916 project, it's, it's the same thing. They didn't want to bring another race into the world. Race wars. This is harsh, but some of the Jewish writings literally state that the Gentiles were only created to fuel the fires of hell. You look at this and you think, how could there be any greater hatred? And yet that's what was going on on one side of the church. On the other side, you had the Gentiles, and they were called the uncircumcised. You know what that meant? It was an expression of contempt. We're going to call you the worst in our minds. You are not part of us. You are an outsider, an outcast. They used the Hebrew term goy. Anyone who was not Jewish was called goy. Goy, they believed that the world consisted of two, two groups. 
the Jews and everyone else. That was it. So we're in the Goy group if you're not Jewish background. Thus we have the picture of the church at Ephesus. You have the Jews and you have the Gentiles. And they're coming in with this new, newfound love for Christ. And they're supposed to put all this stuff behind them. They're supposed to all of a sudden love one another and sing kumbaya, right? That's what they're supposed to do. The hatred of the generations, everything that comes in. Now they're supposed to get along. The Gentiles didn't follow the law. The Jews did. Gentiles weren't circumcised. The Jews were. They, what? All of this, put it together, that's the church. To add matters and make it worse, you had the Jews who had followed God, Jehovah. You had the Gentiles who were polytheistic. They just didn't match in any way, shape, or form. And this makes up the church. The church that believed that God was only one way and only loved one group of people and that you had to follow the law in order to keep him happy and the other group that said there are many gods but now we're figuring this out we're just going to worship this one God and they're bringing all this in you think politics is bad can you imagine being in that church come on I mean, seriously, it doesn't get worse. What I'm trying to do is paint you the picture to help you understand that what we just came through as a nation where people were so divided, these guys would look at it and go, you have got to be kidding. Get over it. They would be saying, look at what we overcame for fellowship around the gospel. Jesus is king. When you put it together, Paul's basically saying that uh, the Gentiles at this time were, or they had been alienated from Christ. Now they're welcome into the church. Look at the next point. The wall came down. That scenario I just painted for you, look at verse 13. When he's talking about these Gentiles and the Jews, the way they felt about the Gentiles, look at what verse 13 says. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off, have brought, been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hey, you Gentiles, you've been brought close by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, the Jews and the Gentiles, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of the commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. Look what Jesus did. Let me read it one more time. In Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off, you Gentiles, have been brought near. How? Because you liked the same things? agreed with the same music, voted for the same person. No, he says you were brought near by the blood of Christ. And he has broken down the middle wall of separation. Think about these two parties coming together as one. These two groups of people, the Jews and the Goy, all coming together, right? You know what it reminded me of? The Berlin Wall. There was a wall that was created in the church, and oftentimes even in, in today's churches. There's this wall that gets put up, and we build it. We build it because they are different than us. We build it because our preferences don't match up with that person's preferences, or that lifestyle doesn't match our lifestyle. It's, it's just different. But we put up this wall, but I remember with the Berlin Wall, any of you that were, were around and you remember this or you've read about it or watched it, if you haven't, I encourage you to go back and just look it up and watch some of the videos, but the Berlin Wall came down. It was a huge concrete barrier that was put up literally to separate East and West Berlin to make sure that the people on one side didn't get to the other side. They didn't want that happening. They didn't want the people in East Berlin escaping. They wanted to keep them contained. It was all during the Cold War, and it was that time where, uh, you know, you remember the famous quote, Ronald Reagan, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. All of this taking place. When the wall came down, you know what happened? Berlin was united in a way that they had not been in many, many, many years. Jesus tore down the wall, the veil of the temple rent, it was torn. And man, when, when he died on the cross, 
any wall that has been constructed inside the church, inside the body of Christ, at that time it came down. It's no longer there, it's down. When you think about that, you realize that he, it says in that verse, he put to death enmity, the hostility between those two groups. We who are in Christ are all one. It says he made from those two groups a new man. What he did is he created not the Jew and the Gentile. He created the people of God, the family of God, those who are in Christ Jesus. So the differences, the petty things that come up inside churches or between churches should not be there. I remember this, one of, one of my favorite memories. 2015, we were over in Israel, and uh, it was a time that there was a blood moon, and there were people from all over the world. There always were. People from all over the world would come to Israel. But we were sitting there on the Mount of Olives, and we're overlooking the city of Jerusalem, and it's at night. And the blood moon was, was to happen later in the, in the evening. There were, bus, there were more buses than I have ever seen in my life packed in there in ways I don't even know how they got them all out to this day. I mean, they were just so tightly packed. And there are little cutouts that you could sit in overlooking the city. And so there was a, an area there that had like bleacher seating cut into the rocks, and then there would be another one, and then there was another one. And this is a place where they commonly will take groups, and you overlook the city, and you can sing together or pray or whatever. Well, that night, all these tour buses are lined up, and there are who knows how many people along this area, looking over the city of Jerusalem. And in one of these little cutouts, a group begins to sing. And it was an old familiar hymn, and everybody knew it. And they sang in one language, and we chimed in in English. And before you knew it, there was another group down here, and they chimed in in their language. Laura, you remember that? That's a special time. And then there was another group, and you would hear it, in languages from around the world and people were walking by and we didn't look the same. Our skin tone, our, our, the shape of our eyes, the color of our skin, everything. We were different. Our language was different. And yet it was such a special time because all of these people from all over the world and all of the different languages with all of their different cultures, all of their different dialects, skin colors, everything, were singing on the Mount of Olives a familiar hymn that brought us all together as the people of God. That was special. And that's what it's saying. That's the unity that comes in knowing Christ. Here in South Florida, we're blessed. We have very multi-ethnic, multilingual, multicultural, multi-generational. Uh, our church and other churches around us, we, we all look the same here in South Florida, meaning that we're all very diverse. That's beautiful. And in the church, when you realize that in the diversity, in the midst of all the diversity, there has to be unity. We realize that we as a church, that God has done all this through Christ. He's created this new people, that we are his family, children of God. It means no politics should ever divide us. That we've got a greater mission. If we step down to politics, we have lowered ourselves because we are ambassadors for Christ. That if we ever allow our preferences to divide us, we're doing something that's ungodly. The family of God can think things differently, but, and we can all have our own opinions on things, but the Bible is always the final authority. But when we draw lines in the sand and we, we part ways over simple preferences, we're being ungodly. That we as a church, when we allow worldly influences to overtake the church and we begin to follow the worldly influences in such a way that we put the Bible on the back burner, we're wrong. We should never let those things divide us. We should be united in the person of Jesus Christ because Jesus is, he's Lord, he's king. No doubt about it. That's why we should be unified. So the last thing you see, on your, or next to the last thing you see on your sheet there, access was granted. Let me read these verses quickly. Verse 17. And he came and he preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near, both Jews and Gentiles, both of you. He's preaching peace and forth. Through him, we both now have access by one spirit to the Father. Now, therefore, we're no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, 
in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. What it's saying? It's saying we are all of one household. Man, even though we're different, we've been brought together. The wall came down. All of these things are together. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. We've got our new family, our new dwelling place. Basically, we're giving people a key to our house. You're my brother and sister in Christ. Where does the term, hey, brother, where does that come from in the church? Hey, sister, where does that come from in the church? It comes from being part of the family of God. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. When we baptize, I baptize you, my brother. I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's where the unity comes from. It's a sad thing. It's got to be to the heart of God when he sees division in the body, when he sees division in a local church or division in the body of Christ at large. It's got to be disappointing, disheartening. We need to be people of God, no longer people without hope because we have Jesus Christ. No longer outsiders, we've been made insiders. No longer excluded, we're included. in Everything that Jesus has is ours. We're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. No longer people without God, because he said a new family was formed. The last point there on your sheet. Look at verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of of the household of God. The veil has been torn. The wall has come down. The family of God has been created. Jews and Gentiles breaking bread together. We need to do more of that as a, as a church family, just breaking bread together. I love the old song, the little kid song, red and yellow, black and white. Oh man, if we put all the colors in for our church, wouldn't it be great? Uh, it's just amazing, the differences. This church I was just thinking through it. We, last time we counted, there were over 30 nationalities of people that were born outside the United States that have come inside the worship in, in this family. And we got people from Antigua, Canada. We got Europeans, Haitians, Jamaicans, Nicaraguans, Nigerians, Filipinos, Spaniards. We have West Germans. We've got people from all over the world that are part of this church family. Folks, we can't let little things like politics and diversity and preferences divide the body of Christ because we know that Jesus is king, regardless what else is going on around us. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 in the new NLT, it says this, So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy have the same father. That's why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. Man, that's exciting. Churches from all over the world making up the body of Christ. And how do we wrap this up this morning? We want to add more people to our family. See, we get to worship together every week. Sometimes we forget why we come. We keep inviting those that are watching online. There's nothing like being here. Shaking somebody's hand, giving them a hug, hearing what's going on in their life, praying with them, being encouraged. These folks have that, and I invite you back. If you haven't been here recently, you've got to come back. But this morning... Our greatest prayer is this. We want to add people to our family. We know we're the family of God. We understand that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we want you to join us. We want you to be one of our brothers and sisters. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, you can. That gift of God that we talked about, the gift of eternal life, is available to everybody in the room, everybody watching online. It's available to all. Jesus said all we have to do is ask. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's a prayer. When we call upon the name of the Lord, it says we'll be, we will be saved. It's not a maybe, it's an, it will be. So I want to invite you this morning. If you're not a child of God yet, you say, I don't know that I have a personal relationship with God as my father. Christ is my brother. I, I don't know if I have that. Then I invite you this morning. We need to confess our sin and invite Jesus to be our Savior. So I'd like to close like that this morning. Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? And if that's you and you say, I don't know that I'm really part of God's family. I've been religious. I go to church. I know some of the rituals, but I don't know if I really have a relationship where I could call God my Father. 
If that's you and you want to know for sure today that you've got peace with God, that you're right with God, would you pray something like this? Pray it silently because it's, it's just between you and God. Call him by name. Say, dear God, today I understand you've got a family. And that family grows by invitation. And you are inviting me to be part of your family. God, today I want to accept that. And I start by confessing my sin. Lord, I know I'm a sinner, and I am so sorry. I've done wrong. And I thank you for Jesus. And on the cross of Calvary, when he shed his blood, and he paid the penalty for my sin, I'm so appreciative. And today I want to accept that free gift I want to accept what he did on the cross. I want my sin forgiven. I want you to be my Savior. And I want to today reserve my place in heaven. I want to be part of your family. If you prayed that this morning, it's just a simple prayer. It can be prayed in many different ways. And if you missed a word or two, I just gave you an idea. It's what is in your heart that means the most. If you prayed that prayer with me this morning, I want to be the first to welcome you to the family of God. Let me pray for you. God, this morning as we look at this and we, we just examine what your word says about unity, we see what Paul said, that we were all in the same condition, dead in our trespasses and sins, that we had the opportunity through the transformation that comes through Christ to become part of your family, to have our sin forgiven, and to be part of this new family that you've created, not Jew or Gentile, but the people of God. And so, Father, this morning, I thank you for those that might have come into our family that called out to you to have their sin forgiven and to invite Jesus to be their Savior. For others in the room that this has been a hard week, maybe it's been a miserable week for them, Lord, I just, I just pray that regardless of the circumstances around us, whether it be an election, whether it be family issues, whether it be job-related issues, financial, whatever the mess, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, that we would not allow ourselves to be brought down to the state of the circumstances, but that we would stay in our position and understand that we are truly family members of your household. God, don't let us be separated or, or distracted from the mission that you've called us to. We place all this in your hands today. We pray for unity in this church and the churches across the community and across the people of South Florida. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.